Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii, should Hawaii require vaccinations for all healthy children? Aloha and welcome to Insights. I'm Malia Maddock, your host for tonight's show. In 2013, the National Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that at 80%, Hawaii had among the highest vaccination rate in the United States. As for the other 20%, some can't get the shots because they're too young or they have health conditions that make the vaccines too risky. Others have religious or philosophical objections to some or perhaps all vaccinations. While there are currently no measles cases in Hawaii, outbreaks connected to Illinois daycare centers and Disneyland have have brought the debate to the forefront. Are unvaccinated children putting those who can't be vaccinated at risk? Tonight, should Hawaii require vaccinations for all healthy children? If you'd like to join the discussion on mandatory vaccinations, please call, email, or tweet your questions and comments during tonight's live broadcast. Now to our panel. Dr. Sarah Park is the State Epidemiologist and Chief of the Department of Health's Disease Outbreak Control Division. In 2012, she was appointed to the National Biodefense Science Board to help prevent, prepare for, and respond to public health emergencies. Senator Josh Green served two terms in the State House of Representatives before being elected to the Senate in 2008. Senator Green is Chairman of the Health Committee and is also an emergency room physician on the Big Island. Dr. Leonard Horowitz is a retired dentist who now works as a public health expert. Dr. Horowitz speaks and writes about why people should opt for natural cures instead of being vaccinated. Janet Edgehill spent 28 years as an electrical engineer for the Department of Defense. She recently earned a doctorate to learn about the education of autistic children like her seven-year-old son, who she believes was vaccine injured. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Dr. Park, if I could start with you. How much risk do unvaccinated children pose to the state in the event of a measles outbreak here? Uh, I think um, it's a, they pose a, quite a significant risk, um, not only to themselves, but to the community. Hence, um, you know, should they be opting out of vaccination, we, we, not unlike other states in the nation, will take the measures to protect them and those around them by asking them to exclude themselves from school um, and from the community in general during the incubation phase if they've been exposed. Um, that's so we can monitor them, they could, you know, and make certain that they get the appropriate care, but also to protect other kids who would be, you know, potentially in danger from uh, getting the disease. So they, they pose quite a significant risk. But I might also add that the risk now is not just from unvaccinated children, but unvaccinated adults, because a number of kids have now grown up, and we now are seeing a sort of a changing epidemiology in that we are seeing unvaccinated kids being affected. We're now seeing the unvaccinated adults, the kids who grew up, and now bringing the, the diseases back home to Hawaii and spreading it in our communities. Um, and many of these diseases are actually worse getting them as an adult. Mm -hmm. So the fear is, you know, for them as well, you know, the worry is that we'll see, start to see some complications that are gonna occur, are more likely to occur in adults. And certainly those over 20 are more likely to have uh, complications from the measles um, virus than, than say those between five and 20. And those complications? You know, they could be as minor, minor as ear infection, otitis media, uh, diarrhea, pneumonia, which can also be quite severe. And then on the more extreme uh, side of the spectrum, something called encephalitis, brain infection, inflammation, um, and even, you know, hospitalization because of all the complications, and then unfortunately death, which fortunately is usually rare um, or uncommon. But you know the, there are all these uh, types of complications, and then of course the long-term complication that many people aren't really aware of is something called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which I unfortunately have taken care of a child who was previously vaccinated, and that's a long-term complication that occurs in people who have recovered from the measles uh, infection, and usually about seven, ten years, maybe a little bit longer down the line, and there's no way to predict who's going to succumb to this. But um, they do, and it's a progressive neurological and uh, mental de uh, degeneration that's usually fatal. Um, it's heartrending to, to, to diagnose it and to watch it happen. All right. 
I'm certain that it is, but what percentage of individuals would contract this, as opposed to how many people have vaccine injuries and a realistic look at vaccine injuries, which don't always occur right on the table? I agree sure. completely. The number one issue that's been completely neglected, grossly neglected, and it's a violation of the public's faith and trust in the public health department, is the fact that there's no definitive risk-benefit analysis done. The cornerstone of public health is to make sure that we're not killing and maiming more people than we're helping and saving. And the fact is, without the definitive data on knowing how many people are being injured, essentially what you're doing is you're propagandizing essentially what amounts to the mass killing of people or maiming of people for profit for the pharmaceutical industrialists. All right, let me get Dr. Green's choice on that. Well, first, let me put this into perspective. You know, I want to be respectful of everyone's opinion. Before vaccinations, polio caused paralysis in vast segments of society and killed people. Before vaccinations, smallpox devastated societies, killing millions of people. Before flu vaccinations, we had global pandemics. Now, I respect people's choices in life of whether they're going to get immunizations or not for their children, but we could be wiped out if we didn't have at least some capacity to immunize ourselves. This has basically been the greatest public health success that we've seen. Now, it is tragic if people have concerns and these complications, when I see people in the ER that have meningitis that they could have prevented, I still have relationships with people who suffered polio. It is so tragic that I think we have to be at least mindful that vaccinations have made a big difference for humanity. Well, speaking well, I, of the polio I, vaccine, go, please go ahead. Uh, the, the polio vaccine initially uh, was was just there was so much faith put into it that it was given to a child of a of a CDC individual, and the child the child died. Maybe the grandchild. You might be more familiar with this. It also was in, it was uh, contaminated with simian virus 40, uh, so called because it was the 40th monkey virus. It's it's, it's cultivated in these monkeys. It's a hideous the story. The reality about um, what the senator just said is is really incomplete. And again, omissions and misrepresentations and laws fraud. So to eventually to say that the polio vaccine caused the disappearance of polio, you have to forget first Salk, and Salk's vaccines were hideously contaminated with SV40, which caused horrific cancer pandemics. The reality is that, in fact, the Salk vaccine replaced by the Sabin vaccine, which really wasn't that much better because it was still live attenuated viruses. The killed Salk vaccine was never fully killed because of the SV40, the 40th monkey virus ever discovered. And two brilliant women went to the National Institutes of Health director, Smidel, and said to him, if you continue, we've tested the Merck pharmaceutical polio vaccine off the shelf. And if you continue to allow these vaccines to go out, I guarantee you over the next 20 years, you'll have epidemics of cancer unlike the world has ever seen. That woman was Bernice Eddy, and it was initially called SE polyoma virus. And essentially, it took her 10 years before she got to the United States Congress and in, in an appeal because she had been demoted, defunded, ostracized, persecuted, and SE polyoma was stolen. They renamed it, Dr. Hilleman at Merck, renamed it the SV40 virus. Basically, it was sexist, it was outrageous, and it was a complete cover-up of what the true reality is with regard to the original polio vaccines. Okay, and let me give, oh, I'm sorry. I Could just we to mention quickly that right. SV40 is still today being isolated in tumors, and cancerous tumors. It, there is also demonstration of vertical transmission between parent to child. That's right. Through genetics. It's hideous. Okay, may I give Dr. Park a chance to respond to well, that? Well, I'm just curious as to the data, your data, in terms of saying, claiming that polio virus is, or vaccine is directly linked to epidemics of cancer, because I certainly haven't seen those studies. But more importantly, you know, there have been huge successes in, in preventing the incidence of polio, and we're making huge strides in, in eliminating this eradicating, not even eliminating, el eradicating. You know, and let me just point out to for folks who may not understand the terms eradication and elimination. Um, for viruses that only exist in humans, such as polio, there is a hope, and such as smallpox, which we have eradicated, there is a hope to actually eradicate it. That means actually wipe it off the face of the earth because it only exists in humans. And that is the goal with the polio initiative for WHO, World Health Organization, the Centers for 
disease control and prevention and those of us in public health. Um, with measles virus, unfortunately, that virus can exist in humans and primates. So the, our goal with measles virus or, and viruses like that or other pathogens like that is actually to eliminate it. It doesn't mean we can, it basically means we can't be successful in wiping it off the face of the earth, but we can be successful in eliminating it from the human population. The CDC declared, you know, and the World Health Organization declared vir the measles virus eliminated from the U.S. in the year 2000. And that meant there was no continuous transmission for 12 months um, of measles in the U.S. at all. That was a, a huge success, but also it was a it was a sobering success because the original goal to eliminate measles was 1982. Um, and so you can see it took quite a long time to actually meet that goal. And now what we're seeing since in the ensuing time is, is a lot of stepping backwards. You know, we made those successes was, were hugely, largely in part because of the vaccination successes. Excuse and now me. because, please let me finish. Um, but now, because we are seeing increasing pockets of vac um, people who are refusing vaccine, now because we have, we're seeing disease uh, uh, basically cropping up again in places where it had been largely eliminated in Europe, where we thought that you know they they were being successful too, um, we're seeing more and more disease elsewhere. It's being brought home, and now we're also seeing it's not being brought home to us by by visitors, by people who don't even live here, but it's being brought home by our own. And as these pockets of unvaccinated grow, we're basically continuing to step backwards in time. And it's really unfortunate. Um, I agree with there, Dr. Green. There's, there's Everyone no is, data. Can I finish? First, well, you've spoken I, now for a couple minutes. Let's go ahead and let her finish her thought, and then let's go to you, Dr. I just want to say, you know, I respect people's opinions. And I would respect that they, I would ex hope that they would also respect mine. I don't, in, I don't anticipate during this conversation we're going to change each other's mind. I, and that is not my goal. My goal is just to pre present our side of it, um, essentially, our, you know, and hopefully educate some folks who might still have questions. And, and that's really it. Because I understand you feel very passionately, so do we. Um, I've taken care of patients who uh, basically have succumbed or have su suffered severe comp uh, complications from vaccine preventable diseases that could have been easily preventable. And so of course I'm passionate. I've had children, I've had parents beg me to do something to help their child. I mean, can you imagine being begged by a parent to, to help them at all costs and to, and to deal with a parent who knows, understands that it could have been prevented. So I understand your passion, but I also would hope that you respect mine. Okay, let's go to Dr. Horowitz, and well, then I'd like to hear from you. First me. of all, you claimed, a, quote, significant risk that unvaccinated children pose to vaccinated children. And you demand from us data on cancer rates increased from vaccinations. But I'm asking have, not you, demanding. You, you have no data on the concept of what you just stated. Essentially, what you've just stated is not scientific. It's completely unscientific. In fact, it's strictly propaganda. Now, Dr. Park, this is from our local newspaper, the Tribune Herald, and it says in here that you're quoted as saying that people like us, it says health official, to not have the vaccine, in my opinion, is crazy. Well, frankly, that makes people like myself crazy. And it makes this PBS, which has done a morning edition stating that breastfeeding mothers and people who engage in natural medicine are all crazy. In fact, they slur them. Uh, excuse, excuse me. Please don't put breastfeeding mothers in the whole no, pot that, of that was a PBS. As a pediatrician, excuse I actually me. am a proponent of breastfeeding. Well, well, well that's very nice. But <laughs> it was, uh, th these people are disparaged. And now you're, this discussion deals with mandatory vaccinations. I had a daughter who was literally evicted from Hilo High School, straight A student, first year freshman varsity, made varsity track and field, told, told to leave. Literally, we had to have a lawsuit involved because she refused for religious reasons to have, uh, to not take the tuberculosis skin test. So I'm very familiar with everything from the science to the politics of this. And what I'm saying is that we're not crazy. You okay. are a, you let are me, let's go let me 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 let
It's not a that's, vaccine. That's right, but it's still, you're injecting foreign but RNA just so and foreign we're not DNA. Mixing, but we're no, not no, mixing no. ideas here. Okay, no, and now, let, wait, I want to give Ms. Edgehill a chance. Go ahead. I, I brought a, a few charts with me because I believe the risk of measles and, and adverse effects from contracting wild measles are grossly overstated. This is just a chart I pulled off from the Centers for Disease Control website from their vital statistics. And we can see that the, the, the vaccine was, was licensed in about 1963. It wasn't widely introduced until mm -hmm. after that. You can see this, this shows the, the death statistics um, per 100,000. And we can see, you can see, Dr. Green, that it's well less than, than one person, about maybe 0.25, maybe less than that. I have something here from the British Medical Journal. These writers agree that measles is nowadays a normally a mild infection. When you say that polio is eradicated, measles has almost been eradicated. Well, what about nutrition? What about sanitation? Exactly. Polio, 49,500 cases of polio from the vaccine in India, in the peer-reviewed Indian Journal, which I'd be happy to share with you. Uh, the vaccine schedule continues to increase out of control. The kids are getting between 49 and over, upwards of 60 vaccines prior to starting school. I think one thing that we can all agree on is that we're not genetic clones. We, there, there are genetic issues that, that we really need to do better at identifying. There's plenty about this in the period of uh, literature, and I'm sure you've read Reeves' study and where the Army has done, they, they vaccinate for everything, and they, they were able to isolate a gene, the MTHFR polymorphism, so, so mutations on a particular gene, uh, which is generally responsible for, for methylation for the way that our bodies detoxify. They identified this in two studies as a risk factor for adverse events. Then I have, I have peer-reviewed literature here by Dr. Gregory Poland. He also happens to be the editor-in-chief of Vaccine, journey, vaccine Journal. It's the peer-reviewed journal of vaccine developers and vaccine manufacturers. He's coined a whole new term and a whole new study, the studies that have been, that are called vaccinomics or adversomics. We know, he knows, he's identified a number of genes that we know not only will they, will they perhaps cause vaccine injury, but they also, people with certain genes, will be conferred with no immunity whatsoever from a vaccine. Okay, let me move on to That's Dr. Right. Green now. Your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, it's a passionate topic, so I appreciate, I really appreciate the discussion. Um, let me first start by saying that in 2000, over 750,000 kids globally died of measles, okay? So 770,000 children died. In third world countries. In the world. Children are children to a doctor. How many died of cancer? Or <laughs> well, let's let Dr. After Green, you stop interviewing, have, after you stop interrupting yeah. me, we'll have a civil conversation, yeah. I, Doc. Let's all give everyone a chance because viewers are turning in so that they can learn. So let's yes. give everyone their chance to speak. So Dr. So, Green. So I say, and I worked as a missionary doctor even Though I'm not a missionary, I'm a Jew, okay, married to a Mormon girl. I immunized my two kids, okay? But 770,000 children died of measles globally, and as a family physician and now an ER doc, that hurts, okay? Also, I'm not saying that we shouldn't continue to improve vaccinations in their formulations. Of course we should. That's science. And I, so I appreciate the statements that were made uh, by Janet. So there's nothing... We're not, I'm not arguing with anyone about always improving the science of our immunology, of what we propose as public health officials. I'm not even trying to defend anyone globally. I'm saying that if we can save children's lives, if we can look at the data, which I believe is sound, we should do it. Okay, I'd like to get to some questions uh, from Lloyd. Uh, don't schools in Hawaii already require children to be vaccinated in order to be admitted? Dr. Park, could you answer that? Yes, so for school entry in the state of Hawaii, it is required to adhere to the vaccine schedule. Um, however, in the state of Hawaii, unlike uh, or like many other states in the nation, you can um, request an exemption from that vaccine requirement, either a medical exemption. So a physician would testify, would um, basically uh, um, validate the fact that there's a problem with your immune system. Usually it's, for instance, a child who's on chemotherapy, and obviously that affects their, their immune so system. So they just medically can't get the vaccination, they're exempt. Right, okay. so they're exempt for that period that they're on the chemotherapy. It's not a, you know, all for life kind of thing. Um, but the other potential is to uh, request a religious, what we call a religious exemption, which really in all intents and purposes is, a, is essentially a philosophical exemption because a parent can just write in and say it's against their personal belief. Um, and so that is a route that people can take. Um, and are those exemptions going up or down? Do we have any sense of what they, the trend is? The medical exemptions have stayed stable, which is a good news in some regards because obviously if it went up, we, we, we'd be worried that we're seeing some sort of medical issue among our children. Um, the religious exemptions, however, 
just like in many other states, we're starting to see it edge higher and higher. And that is, that's what I'm referring to, is that is the concern. You know, before people used to, you maybe say, oh, well, we know this community on this particular island is, that's where they are, all these anti-vaccine folks are. Um, but what we are seeing now is it's scattered throughout the state. And it's like every other state in the nation, we're seeing it in every community. And as I was just saying to someone, it could be your next door neighbor. It's not just a, you know, one, one area of one population. Um, so it is it is starting to grow but this is an option for uh, for kids in Hawaii for their parents if they are really strongly against it um, however as I mentioned earlier we do have the authority to protect the public's health and in and, and again protect the individual and say if you've been exposed or if you actually have a vaccine preventable disease I mean you're I'm sorry, but you need to be isolated from the rest of the public. I have a quick follow-up question to that. If, say, a small private school that isn't part of the DOE were to want to change their philosophy about allowing this children... This applies public or private. A, the only, a, a private school cannot decide we're no, going to change our policy. this applies to mm -hmm. public and private. The only um, exceptions would be children who are homeschooled. Okay. Because and they, they're not in a group setting, They can choose to opt out. Okay, I'm sorry, you wanted to say, Sajjo? You know, I forgot. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Let's no, I, what, I, what I actually did want to point something. out, what I did want to point out actually, was the live viruses do shed. We do in fact have shedding, and you guys have, have shared sob stories, sad stories of, of patients who have succumbed to what she termed vaccine preventable diseases. Um, I have a friend whose daughter at 15 months received the MMR. She quickly deteriorated, descended into autism, bowel disease, all sorts of other things. But on top of that, three weeks after receiving the vaccine, the measles virus shed in, in her poop, in her diaper. Her mom was changing the diaper. Didn't know she was perhaps an immunocompromised person. Developed multiple sclerosis, a very severe case. She had to be institutionalized, a young woman in her 30s. So there, there are all sorts of cases where vaccinated people do in fact shed. We know that the DTaP vaccine, for example, is not fully effective. Tons of research, peer-reviewed research about the lack of effectivity. But what we hear from the medical community is it's unvaccinated people. There's a study that showed over 80% of people in the California outbreak were, were fully vaccinated. Another, I don't know, 10% or so were, were partially vaccinated and the remainder percentage were not vaccinated at all. Um, so there also, in, I brought- this, this is in reference to what you were saying earlier and what Josh was saying mm -hmm. that I agree with him and agree with you in that, you know, we are constantly trying to improve the medical tools that we have to protect the public's health, to protect children and, and as I said, not but, just children, but adults. And so, yes, the vaccines, and I've said this over and over, vaccines are not perfect in their protection. Well, they're not Nothing perfect. Nothing is 100%. And they injure, and you and so, wait, the lives wait, who so are injured. So I'm just addressing your comment that, you know, there could be fully, fully vaccinated individuals who unfortunately get disease. And there is always a possibility because as you also, you yourself pointed out, and I agree with you, everyone's immune system is a little different. A little and different. and okay. therefore, in that, you know, I'm agreeing with you on that. that and that's why you cannot say that 100%, you can't when say 100% When over 80% of the population efficacy. is fully vaccinated, so, contract the disease, what does that but say? But if you think about, in November of 2013, the goal is to increase the immunity of the entire population. But it isn't doing that. Understanding it that there, that. understanding that there will always be a few, a handful of people is who will just not respond. Is 82% a few to you? Is that is that a few? Because it's, it seems to actually, me like it's the majority. I would disagree with you and on the efficacy on that. Are religious people crazy? So, are um, people who are conscientious objectors crazy? Okay, in your opinion, I have is. to. Uh, when you you reference, I want to do one clar clarification for our viewers. You mentioned MMR. Is that measles, mumps, rubella, mm -hmm. yes. and that's the vaccine that is it, that you're referring to and that yes. has received some controversial yes, coverage. Yes, in fact, Mark is being sued by two whistleblowers. And there is also a CDC whistleblower who has uh, who is providing information to Congressman Posey's office. Um, they, he's indicated that that statistically significant information was withheld from a 2004 study that showed a rapid increase, uh, 340 or 3.4 fold, in African American males who received the vaccine prior to three years of age. Uh, this is very important information. Um, hopefully, he'll be providing further information. Uh, he released an email from Colleen Boyle, who's in, the, in charge of developmental disabilities at the CDC, in which she said, well, you know, it's not usually diagnosed until three. How about if we introduce 18-month-olds and one-month-olds and two-year-olds into this? What does that do to our data? So it shows you they're, they're somewhat uh, cooking the books in, in some cases. But, but if, I can get, if I can get back to, to DTaP and to, to diphtheria, pertussis, uh, tetanus, 
uh, the FDA released a, a press release in November 2013, and they said, you know, we've been We've been testing Bordetella pertussis vaccine in orangutans, which have a similar physiology for the purposes of, of this sort of a trial. We have found pertussis germs are now growing in the backs of their throats and they are contagious for several weeks with pertussis. So we could argue that vaccinated individuals are in fact spreading disease. It's not, it's not a catch-all. And we need to elevate this argument or this discussion beyond vaccines well, good, disease let me, let me bad. I understand what you're saying. You're, wait, wait, wait. Just I, I just want to make sure I understand what website. he's saying. Okay, okay. let's go ahead. And I just like some clarification. Let's have a quick moment with you and then let's go to you, Dr. Horowitz. I just want to, I just want to make sure I am understanding what you're saying because I don't want to misunderstand you. Okay. Um, but you're saying that you're, you, so you're saying that um, people who are vaccinated against pertussis or whooping cough for mm -hmm. those of those folks who don't know um, are, are spreading whooping cough to other people? They are, in fact, spreading whooping cough so to other see, people. So, see, this uh, is where I have a, a little bit of a problem scientifically with that. Because, so you don't believe because, our federal because, government? Because, wait, listen, because the vaccines, that vaccine is an inactivated vaccine. It doesn't it even is. contain the it entire bacteria. It is a cellular, bacteria. you were right. It only so contains how antigens. how does so it? They don't know. Do it scientists can't. know everything? So what the answer I'm, is no. You're, you yourself are an engineer. You're, you have a science background, mm -hmm. so you know Although you are not a biologist, you would know then that that scientifically does not make very sense. Articulate. She okay. Have you taken care about. of a child with whooping cough? I, I, have you taken care ask. of a child with autism? Let me answer your question. Let me answer your question. You'll tell me about I it. I received <laughs> probably at least three or four telephone calls from parents who have injured children after vaccines, and I'm sick and tired of it, frankly. The reality is you're not paying any attention to the data of the risks versus you, what you claim are the benefits. There are significant In fact, I do. risks. As a pediatrician, okay. as a state of Excuse me, let me finish. The fact that you're not aware that the, the, the fact is so no, no. disease. Let's let everyone have a chance to simply say their information. Dr. Horowitz, please go ahead, finish your Thank point, you and then much. I have a follow up question for you. So if you Thank could finish you. your point. If vaccines worked, why would you be so concerned about those few people, let's say 3% in Hawaii, who, for religious reasons or any other reason, philosophical, they Exempt out. Because Number I worry one. About them. Oh yeah, you want herd immunity. Now wait a minute. No, no. Let's take a look at your conflicting <laughs> interests. Do you work on the board of the National Biosurveillance and Response with Pfizer? No. Pfizer is not one of seven members of that board. It's a government board. It's an uh, federal excuse me, advisory is, is committee. It's one of the major people administering decision making on a national basis with Pfizer Group and representing now an influence on the national response, you know, emergency response. There are members from different, deliberately from different um, walks of life on How that How many board, are there? And we are not supposed to be bringing in our sort of commercial interests or Exactly, whatnot. you're not supposed, supposed to be, that's my point. But the point I is it's outrageously okay, Let's make this a little less personal though. Yeah. Let's talk about facts, everyone. Is, look, if you saw a murder going on in the street, and you don't report that. You have a public duty to report that, to do everything in your power to stop that crime. That, in fact, that's public I duty. I just doctor. want to clarify, so though. It's, it is personal. There are children that I'm hearing from parents I agree. weekly, many of them, who are outraged that the government, in this case, this, uh, Dr. Park, represents the entire mm -hmm. national security apparatus that is potentially keeping us from an outbreak and emergency. And, and the reality is that the manner in which they're going about doing this is injecting foreign RNA, foreign DNA from bacteria, viruses, fungus, yeast, ones. chicken embryo, uh -oh. bovine fetal serum, monkey kidney tissues like to with smallpox, it's your... cow pus. <laughs> you might as well inject eye of newt because the reality is they don't know what the heck they're doing. Okay, I, I know I do want to get back to you. I would like to give mm -hmm. Dr. Green a chance to talk. And I would also sure. like to just ask everyone, mm -hmm. I understand this is a passionate topic, but we're not going to learn anything tonight shouting mm -hmm. over each other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. everyone's been invited here as a guest, so let's not attack anyone. Let's just let everyone have their chance to say something. Dr. Green. Look, I'm just pleased to be the calm one. <laughs> okay, so, you know, it's been a long day. Okay, but look, um, first of all, I don't know everyone at this table well. Dr. Park is an extraordinary individual. I'm going to say this because it's not, it's not acceptable to me personally to have someone reference murder and this and that and then accuse someone. This is a person that works to prevent from her paradigm, which I respect and if others don't, that's okay, to prevent infection from spreading. 
I turn to her and trust her to protect my children. I'm just saying that as a father, okay? Now, people can argue about immunizations, they can argue about the mandates, and they can argue about the efficacy. But let's keep it at science. And it's good to talk about whether this science is good or a better study could be done. That's how science works, and we should always endeavor to improve science. But I will not allow vaccinations and their value to be dismissed. By the same token, I never, you know, talk down someone if they're concerned because we can always learn more. And if we learn through science that vaccinations hurt someone, if we learn that, then we will adjust them or we'll change policy. Then let me ask you this follow-up question from Bill in IAEA. Are there reasons other than vaccinations that might account for more cases of autism? And I'll give everyone a chance to respond with their opinion. But Dr. Green, may I start with you? Absolutely. I I'm very focused on this issue. Uh, autism is tragic. It breaks my heart. It breaks everyone's heart that has a child. Absolutely, though, is from my perspective a multifactorial problem. I have personally been very concerned about many factors that affect children and get in, result in autism, result in autism spectrum diagnoses. I think personally that a lot of the problems from industrialized society are contributing. I think it is pesticides. I think our diagnoses are becoming more sophisticated and that has changed the number. And so those are the kind of concerns I have. And I'm also open at all times for the science to absolutely proceed. So we find out whether there's a genetic cause, whether it's fractured DNA. I don't know. I'm not a molecular biologist, but I know it's not just one factor because that doesn't make sense to me as a developmental problem. I was speaking with a dear friend who her life has been affected by this and she said something to me that I was wondering is this a middle ground for everyone she said I believe that vaccines have value for people she thought that there was a possibility that her child and other children might fall into a group for whom vaccines are dangerous and that perhaps there need to be studies to identify if there are some children for whom vaccines are dangerous while for the majority of the public they are beneficial. Any thoughts on that? Is there well, some sort of middle ground there? I, I think we know that. I think that we can agree with that. And I think that, you so know, if you're, if you're happy you, to look at this, this is a peer-reviewed uh, literature about, about vaccinomics, how we're determining but the ultimate goal of, of individualizing vaccines to different uh, genetic polymorphisms. I mean, we know that they hurt people. And you it is the only product that I know of that is indemnified. So in 1986, uh, a law was passed called the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. And so what the intent of this act was, was to give uh, easy access um, to a financial settlement for children who, who were injured by vaccines. But vaccine manufacturers had come and said, you know, this is an unavoidably unsafe product. Uh, we're not going to make them anymore. And so to ensure a steady supply of vaccines, the government went ahead and indemnified vaccine manufacturers. Now, if you were to prescribe a medication for me, and let's say fainting was a side effect, and I called you in a week and I said, you know, I fainted twice, you would probably say, it's listed as a side effect. You should stop taking it. But if the minute we say that vaccines can cause side effects, which are all listed right there in the vaccine inserts, and some of them are pretty horrific, and I have one for, for DTAP here. Autism and, and SIDS DTAP are listed. And DTAP is, can you explain? Um, sorry, that's the diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular okay. pertussis. Which, so the whole, whole cell pertussis vaccination was causing an awful lot of vaccine injuries. And so they try, in, in, in an effort to make it safer, they remove, the, they take only the antigen, so only the part of the, the, the cell that's going to produce an antibody. But this information is out there. We know that there are, there are huge subsets of people who, for whom vaccination is not safe. Yet, on day one of life, we vaccinate neonates with an immature blood-brain ba barrier against a sexually transmitted, blood-borne, you know, usually a disease associated with drug addicts, hepatitis, hepatitis B. B yeah. And we know that, that this does not confer immunity for more than a few years. So is your toddler having sex? Yeah. So, Dr. Park, may I jump to you? What, what, what is the thinking behind this vaccination? Between, behind the hepatitis B vaccination mm -hmm. since we're changing gears mm -hmm. here. Um, so first of all, yes, it's an STD, a sexually transmitted disease, but it's also been linked to high rates of um, hepatocarcinoma or liver cancer, which is a very severe disease and in many cases incurable. Um, you know, this, this is one of the successes the of vaccines. For an oh, can I finish? <laughs> um, and so, you know, some of these infants, unfortunately, you know, 
they, they are high risk infants. Not all infants, but we can't predict. We don't know the history behind every mother and every child. And so the hope is that we can prevent potentially a blood borne risk. That you the know, mother might be giving the this to the child? The mother might have given it to the child, you know, um, in some way. Or the, the child may, in, their, in the course of their life, they're in a situation where they're introduced to it, not necessarily, necessarily through a sexually transmitted act or through blood borne pathogen. Um, maybe even, unfortunately, through nosocomial, through healthcare associated, maybe they get a blood transfusion and it was missed, which hopefully these days is not likely, but you know, blood transfusion being the, so I'm just putting out there the different oh, that's the potential scenarios. I, I understand but that, but the but other again, thing is, you know, we're trying to capture we're trying to capture um, the opportunity before they get to that risk period because unfortunately, um, you know, kids are becoming more more sexually active earlier in life. Not all, but there are some out there. You can't predict. I, you know, I could tell you some stories as a pediatrician that I've experienced that would really surprise a lot of parents out there. And and so we know this is a reality. We know it's not all, but it's it's trying to grab an opportunity where we can find it. You know, and that's why we vaccinate and but to again, prevent size, against the potential. All. It doesn't work. Yeah. You know, and it's not fair. I don't disagree with you. One size doesn't fit all. I don't disagree with you that saying that there's always room and need for study, and it, and that's why I would point you. Agree with you. That is why there there's all sorts of research looking, trying to see is determine is there a link between some sort of adverse effect and vaccine, and over and over and over again they keep not finding it. You know, that's and, specific. And that's that's just not yeah, factual. That's but it's they not keep, factual. But we what keep the media looking, points out are keep, certain studies that I are pro-vaccine, and that's all you get. But I'm the trying AI to point out to you is that that's why we continue to look for it, and that's why the science is important, because we are concerned. And the concern is not for just, you know, the entire population, but for each and every child. And it's not that mm. we're trying to protect, you know, everyone else. We're trying to protect everyone. All right. Dr. Well, Horowitz, what would you like to risk? say? Yes. Well, the issue of mandatory vaccinations, actually, you've got to go back in the law. The first case was Jake Jacobson versus the public health, Boston Public Health Department. And the, the reality at that time, and the reason why the it was, decision was made, exactly what Dr. Park is saying, that for the benefit of the herd, the mass public, we're going to neglect the individual. In that case, Mr. Jacobson was a minister, a religious person who said, no, I'm not going to buy into this vaccine. I don't want to be intoxicate my body because Leviticus 19.19 says to keep my blood pure. What happened was that in those days, we didn't have what we have today that's sitting on the board with Dr. Park on the National Biosurveillance Board. We didn't have a drug cartel. We had people who had faith in the medical system, they had faith in medical doctors, and they had faith in the truth being told to the people. Today, we have outrageous violations, criminal contempt. The fact is that this organization that Dr. Park sits in uh, outrageously has been Find is it biosurveillance or biodefense? Bi biodefense and surveillance it's and been response. It's renamed as the National Preparedness and Science, uh, National, yeah, National Preparedness and Response Science Board. And by the way, I have just terminated my, um, my, my tenure on that, and I'm now on the National Advisory for Children and Disasters um, Board, which is a committee, which is a completely separate issue. But let um, me just finish, but, but let me just say, you know, you, you keep pointing out we're on this board, we're on this board. Oh, excuse me, but I'm I would talking also about just Pfizer. Out, I'd like to talk actually, about Pfizer for a second. We actually that committee, that board, doesn't deliberate on vaccines or things like it purchases we, for the federal government we vaccinations we for the children. And the senator is now advancing. The senator so, is advancing legislation right now. And you're pulling right things now. in that are out of context. Please. Okay, you I'd like that? to actually move on to some things that would be <laughs> informative to thing, people. Mm -hmm. One thing, last thing. This pharmaceutical company called Pfizer has been fined by the United States Attorneys General. 1.3 billion, billion, not million, billion dollars for fraud. And it's the biggest outrage and it's the biggest um, payment and damage award that has been given to the federal government for the violations of the public's trust by Pfizer. 2.3 billion also for the, what was called Bextra, which is a, an arthritis drug. And this is the organization, in fact, I brought the documentation here from the European Union, because both the senator and Dr. Park is saying we need to go forward with the 
vaccination for uh, the uh, pneumococcal for the otitis media situation. And the fact is that the European Union, in this sophisticated study, said there's no good risk benefit analysis. In fact, they conclude that no, it doesn't seem like they should go where the United States has gone. Thanks to Dr. Park and her colleagues sitting on that board and on ACIP. Um, please don't bring that board into it because it's totally out of context with but what you're our saying. But you're saying the same is. thing. You're, 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 okay, you're let's go to some questions thing. because I think we've we've talked about that enough. Uh, from Robert <laughs> Allen, what happened to smallpox in America? Is there a smallpox vaccination? Can anyone address that? There is a smallpox Dr. Grant, there is, the there is a it. smallpox a vaccine. Um, it's uh, it is given to the military folks because of the potential threat that there could be a reintroduction of smallpox from a, a terrorist um, event. But it's considered eradicated from the world because there is no wild type or normally occurring smallpox in the world. It was a huge success, as I mentioned earlier. So there's no smallpox disease, but there are, um, you know, just as here in the U.S. as well as some other countries, they maintain a vaccine just in case because we know that there is a potential some terrorist out there could reintroduce it to the population. And that's a threat. Mm -hmm. A question I got a lot from people in talking about the fact that we were going to have this show is if you're an adult, if you had the uh, measles vaccine when you were a child, if you choose vaccination, do adults need to be revaccinated with this uptick in measles? No, so generally speaking, if you were born before 1957, you were considered to likely have had the disease because the disease was rampant at the time and it is so highly communicable. I mean, essentially, in a room full of susceptible individuals, if you drop someone with measles in that room, 90% of those individuals will become infected. It's, um, it's pretty much almost guaranteed if you're susceptible, you're gonna mm -hmm. get the disease. Mm -hmm. um, so it's felt that if you were born before 1957, likely you had the disease because pretty much by the time you were 15 years of age, no one escaped having had the disease. Mm -hmm. So you're safe um, in terms of, you, you're naturally immune. Since then, um, then we expect that people should have been vaccinated with at least one dose. Now the caveat is that the early doses, early forms of a measles vaccine, they actually had an inactivated form, not a live virus vaccine, which was not very effective um, in terms of immunity. So for those individuals, they actually say up until, they were probably vaccinated using that vaccine up until about uh, 1967 or so. And so the recommendation is up until that point, for those adults, you may want to consider, you know, it would be highly recommended, especially if you're going to a high-risk situation, you travel a lot internationally, um, uh, for example, that you get the current MMR formulation, which is a live virus because it's a highly effective uh, vaccine. Not 100%, but it's highly effective. So at least one dose. Um, for everyone else, it, it's expected that, you know, uh, over time, probably most adults uh, got have gotten two doses because we instituted, instituted the second dose in 1989. Um, the first dose, as was mentioned, as Janet mentioned, was um, begun to be uh, distributed and, uh, and administered in 1963. So most people, basically, long story short, has, have probably had one dose of vaccine. At this point, it's considered if you've had that one dose, it's You're a valid good. MMR, it should be good you know. to cover. All right, Dr. Green, do all countries require measles, mumps, rubella vaccination? What are, are the, the sort of worldwide immunization on that? Not, not all countries um, have that level of public health mm -hmm. organization. So there are countries out there that have very high, you know, high percentages of individuals with measles, mumps, rubella. And what happens is when people get measles, some of the children die, some of the children get complications. They can become, if they have a bad encephalopathy, they can become blind. They can have severe um, uh, mental retardation or you know, intellectual disability. They can, I mean, it's, it's pretty catastrophic. And also, a lot of those countries have large, large cohorts in their families. There's, you know, the birth rate's very high, and it's very easy to spread these diseases. And I worked in, in South Africa and Swaziland. I saw these things. And I have to tell you, this is just the observations of a guy who's been a doc in Hawaii and in Pennsylvania, and also a physician in um, South Africa as a volunteer physician. I would take the healthcare profile of our community every day over the healthcare profile of some of these other countries or communities that don't have access to immunizations or don't have resources because when you see a cluster of people infected with something you feel as a physician you could have helped prevent, it's unbelievable. And I never met 
a mother or father while their child was being, while I was taking care of their child who could be dying of meningitis or suffering a severe complication for a lifetime. I never met, maybe they're out there, but I never met a parent that didn't just shriek in horror that they couldn't have done something. They want you to do something. And, and that's my observation as a doc. I'm sure there are other positions. Okay, let me go to Ms. Edgehill. What can you say to a parent of an autistic child whose symptoms manifested right after a round of vaccines? Can you address sort of your experience with that? Well, uh, let, let me just say that um, if an adult were to come to your practice and suddenly had lost the ability to walk, to talk, they became incontinent, they no longer processed language, you would probably not consider it a coincidence and you would probably you know, let's let's do a CAT scan. Let's do an MRI. Let's 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 dig into this. But if a toddler came into your practice, you would like say that. it's a coincidence, and you would say it's just autism. We don't know why this happens. It's all a coincidence. It happens around vaccine time. We're vaccinating children younger and younger, and now we tell pregnant women, you don't drink a glass of wine when you're pregnant, but let's go ahead and vaccinate you with with pertussis. Uh, let's let's give you the flu vax. There, there, are, there are studies that show a huge uptake in spontaneous abortion, well above what you would expect in, in a normal pregnancy after flu vaccination, after DTaP vaccination. When you look at epidemiological studies, you're looking at statistics across a wide swath of a population who have gotten a disease or who have received a vaccine, and, and you're looking at outcomes, but there's often no context given because it is a statistical analysis. But when I, when I hear medical doctors tell me that there is no literature that, that shows any sort of a link, then I don't think they're looking in the right places. And I, and I don't mean to demean your education and your experience. I think, though, that perhaps your observation is biased as mine is. You see sick people, let's face it. But most people who get measles, when I was young, we had measles parties. People got it. And you know what? You were sick for five days, maybe a week, and rarely were there complications. Because oftentimes, measles complications come with secondary opportunistic infections. And, and probably I would go to the doctor, and he would say, you know what? You need an antibiotic. Um, that's not happening. Um, right here, I have the, the package insert for Ms. Edge, may I just mm. interrupt you for one second? Mm. Bring it back to their question about the autism, because you speak from experience. Can you address mm. sort of people's concerns in terms of mm. symptoms manifested after a round I, I of vaccines? I think you're right to be concerned. And, and, I think that, and I think that you should, well, there's, uh, <laughs> it's hard to treat because autism is brain damage. Let's face it, we, we call it autism. And why it presents heterogeneously so different in people is because different metapath there, metabolic pathways are. There are some ways are, to deal with there, it. There are, in fact, ways to deal with it, but it's not a one size off its approach. But, you know, I, I brought the package insert for DTaP, and one of the adverse events for the diphtheria, tetanus, and a cellular pertussis vaccine is autism. It's listed right on the package insert. What you receive, and, and SIDS, what you receive in a doctor's office, is, it tells you, you know, you sign this, we're going to vaccinate your kid, and they could, it's a one in a million chance that your child will be harmed. That's not a package insert, and these are all available on the FDA.gov website. And you should just take a look at what, what you're injecting into your child, and you should decide if, and do a risk benefit analysis of your own. And um, if, if you're able, a genetic profile of your child for, for Is there, risk factors. Are there studies being done in terms of increasing the amount of, of sort of genetic profiles and no. determining whether there might be groups that are not vaccine appropriate, Dr. Park? I'm sure there are, but there's no. also studies trying to determine are we seeing increasing uh, instance of autism related to vaccine vaccine um, or vaccine mm -hmm. injuries, et cetera. Um, and uh, there was a very interesting study, a very landmark study done by a group in California actually looking at all their, their entire autism registry because there was just this wondering, you know, is there a link there? And what they found was that autism was increasing in incidents, but meanwhile, it was during a time when we were doing more and more to decrease things like thimerosal in vaccines, while we were seeing increase in vaccine exemptions. So it's interesting, why are we seeing increase in autism when we're doing all we can to decrease the, some of the issues around um, vaccines, as well, okay. as, um, as well as seeing increase in vaccine exemptions. Okay. Um, on top of that, in terms of, you know, if you look at some countries where, you know, they've had, um, they, they have a full, you know, thimerosal and various other things. There's, they don't see the same thing we do in terms of autism and things like okay, this. Okay, so take a look at Great Britain's so statistics, it, but let me let me address the thimerosal. So, but what I'm just trying to point out is, yes, there are studies out there, and everyone's trying to look at the different studies and try to understand better. And I think again, we're we're always trying to understand. And right now, at this point, there is not compelling ed evidence. It doesn't mean we stop looking, but honestly, from my perspective, what I what I find. Um, really just really sad really to me as a pediatrician who cares about all these kids 
is the fact, and you know, I actually worry about the kids who have autism. I know you sort of discounted my concern, but I am worried, and what I worry most about is that I see all this effort towards looking at, well, it must be the vaccines, must be the vaccines, and I want to see more research into understanding autism in you, total. You and I can get okay. together and offline, but let me, let me address May I just read I, I do want to, everyone is going to get a chance, absolutely, okay. to address that, because everyone I can tell is dying what she said. What I would like to do is I would like to go ahead and start with you, Dr. Horowitz, and then we're going to go around the table, because it looks like everyone has information to share. Well, the, the first thing is, most parents, like your question, have concern as to how do you deal with the problem after it's created. In medicine, you have to diagnose before you can treat. You have to see through. Diagnosis means see through to the root of the disorder. Well, the root of the disorder in the vaccinations is you have what's called antigenic complexes form. Let me give you an example of what that means. When you get injected with foreign RNA and DNA from, as I mentioned, all these different sources, bacteria, viruses, fungus, yeast, with smallpox, which we mentioned, it's literally cow pus. When you get injected with that, what happens is those protein particles land on your own host cell proteins. And it kind of like forms a globule, comes together, and that's what's called an antigenic complex. That your white blood cell bodyguards, which is your immune system, recognizes that whole complex as foreign. And it now sends messages out to the rest of the white blood cell bodyguards throughout the entire immune system. It says, if you ever see this, attack and destroy. Now you have the reason why, the best explanation, why you have all of the increases in all of the autoimmune diseases. 80 some odd different new diseases have been prompted, in my opinion, based on the evidence from the vaccinations. You have chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, lupus, MS, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, chronic crippling rheumatoid arthritis, adult and juvenile type 1 diabetes, Crohn's disease, Guillain-Barre that my mother died from after she got the swine flu vaccine in 1976. I could go on and on. There's 80 some odd diseases. So the reality is these folks that, as you mentioned, have a paradigm. You have a view of the way a human being is and that we're going to chemically treat it, we're going to pharmaceutically treat it, completely neglecting what the other guests had been previously scheduled, dealing with the holistic medicine. The fact is, I don't know about you, but I'm a spiritual being. Okay, we're I'm an our... energy being, and I want to be treated as such, and now you begin to integrate the entire religious and philosophical and spiritual, as well as scientific. Okay, I want to give physics, everyone a chance. Dr. Green, I'd like to go to Dr. Green. Sure. Well, I would say that each of us can choose to be treated how we like to be treated, and that's the part of the respect that we have for all humankind. My, my general belief about these multiple immunologic you know, concerns and syndromes and diseases that have arisen is that there is a multitude of insults to the immune system that, yes, are very scary and, and terrifying. And you can talk about heavy metals, you can talk about pesticides, you can talk about all of these things that have developed over the last 100, 200 years, okay? That, in my opinion, is what is causing an uptick in developmental disorders that are tragic and a lot of these other major problems. But to pigeonhole physicians as in only focused on one medical model, that's just not a, re that's not a reasonable way to approach things. That's a bombastic approach, but there are many physicians, there are many naturopaths who I have a great deal of respect for. People will choose the modalities they want, but if we base it on science, my feeling is it will take better care of more people. All right, Ms. Edgehill. I just want to address her point about thimerosal quickly. Uh, briefly, thimerosal has, was largely in 2001-2002, if ethyl mercury compound, uh, taken out of childhood vaccines for, for vaccines for children six and under. It is still in the seasonal flu vaccine, and uh, it's another one as well. But, but however, when we look at statistics, and I don't believe thimerosal is the sole cause of autism. I believe it's a contributing factor. When we look at our statistics from the CDC, the, the, the 1 in 68 figure is for children who were born in 2002. So you would not see the effects of thimerosal coming out of vaccines yet. So it could be that we'll see a reduction. But what I'm more concerned about with is adjuvants and that they have been implicated in Gulf 4 syndrome, and they do indeed, uh, they, they injure uh, adults as well. Uh, so briefly, uh, an, an adjuvant, if you're getting a, a killed virus, your body will not recognize it and, and go on the offensive. So we have to do something artificial to ramp up your immune system. So the, the most common one is aluminum hydroxide, ALHO3. 
it's been shown to be neurotoxic. And the, the paper that I get from Lupus, a peer-reviewed journal, um, it talk, it's, it's a, by, a work by Yehuda Schoenfeld. He's done a lot of work in, in what he calls autoimmune syndrome induced, induced by adjuvants. And this is also a huge concern. And there are many foreign bodies that don't belong in your body. Flu block, the flu, va flu vaccine is cultivated in army flatworm. It's a parasite. And this DNA is going into your okay, body. Okay, we're in our final moment. Dr. Green? Second. The reality is people put a lot of terrible toxins in their bodies, and I think people could do a lot better taking care of themselves. <laughs> and, I'll, and I don't think Dr. Park has had a chance in this last round, so I'd defer. <laughs> okay, Dr. Park, really quickly. I'd just say I respect the fact you're not a physician, so, you know, I understand that you I've don't... I've you I don't... I, I would... It, understand and appreciate that you don't have the same perspective that we do, but um, just to your comment about how vaccines work, then I would posit to you, uh, present to you, how do you suppose natural immunity then occurs? It's, it occurs exactly Great the same. Great question. I'd you love know, to the, the that. difference, All right, we have 30 the difference seconds. being that yeah. The difference is the vaccine only presents that part that will induce your body to recognize it as foreign, whereas the disease will do that and give you the disease itself and the complication. So the idea of vaccine is to try to give something, introduce something to the body in a safe fashion. And I agree, the studies need to continue. Okay, Dr. Horowitz, you've got 10 seconds. <laughs> the word immunization is a complete fraud. Immunization is a natural exposure to a natural germ via a nat natural route and vaccination is an injection, it's intoxicating, it's full of all sorts of chemicals. Okay, and we're gonna have Thank to you. leave it there. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks the proposed Ho'opili community on agricultural land in Eva has cleared a hurdle in the city council. It's also reignited the debate over whether Oahu should rezone more prime farming land for development. Supporters of the housing project say it's sustainable with plans that include homes, commercial space, and schools, and also preserving some areas for farming. But agriculture proponents say some of the crops that grow in Eva can't survive in wetter parts of the island. With the push for more locally sourced food, they argue that keeping the land for agriculture is essential. Next week, housing or agriculture, which does Hawaii need more? That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Malia Maddock. Kung hi fa choi and ahui ho.